scripture this morning is from 1 Corinthians 4, verse 1 through 5. Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by a human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. For I know of nothing against myself, yet I am not justified by this. But he who judges me is the Lord. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts. Then each one's praise will come from God. Good morning. So today we're going to be talking about judging. But I used to hear this phrase when I was little. Know it like the back of your hand. So I want you to do a favor for me. Flip your hand over so you can't see the back and cheat. Some of you are going to cheat. I know this. I'm trying to see your hand. Okay, hand up. I want you to think about this. Try to figure out without looking how many scars you have on your hand. I, I was always told this. When I was little, they said, all you have to do is, you know, know it like the back of your hand. And then I, was, I got to looking at my hand and realized I have no idea what it looks like. I have two freckles on my hand. I never knew existed. Because you know what? I don't know it like the back of my hand. And that is something I am claimed to know. So when we talk about this, we're going to start off with this. We're going to talk about judging. We're going to be talking about judging, not the heart. The apostles are used as the example in this story. How even the apostle Paul wouldn't say that he was declared righteous. And we're talking about judging. We're talking giving a final verdict. We're talking about that condemnation that you're good, you're bad. Here's the sentence. And what he says here is that he doesn't even know himself enough to pass final judgment. He says, I can't think of anything against me, but that doesn't mean there's nothing against me. Because the only one who knows enough of our darkness, our heart, to judge us, is God. So this, this week we're going to start a series on judging. Next week we'll talk about judging and your command to do it. This week we're going to talk about judging and your command not to do it. And then we're going to talk about righteous judges. And in all this, the biggest difference is he is talking about how we judge. There is a way that we judge that is terrible and we all do it. How many people walk into a room and we already think we know about them? Right? You hear me start talking, you're like, you're pretty dumb, aren't you? Y'all should have waited for me to prove you're right. But you didn't. You're like, you sound that dumb. Mm-hmm. And it's a natural thing. We make these assumptions. We look at people and we want to say, yes, we see your behavior and we know your heart. And God does not allow that. God doesn't allow us to go, well, I see something. Let me tell you a little more. We're going to start in verse 6 with this concept of only judging what he allows. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Starting in verse 6. Now these things, brethren, I have figuredly applied to myself and Apollos for your sake. So then in us you may learn not to exceed what is written, so that no one of you will become arrogant in behalf of one against the other. For who regards you as superior? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast? As if you had not received it. You are already filled. You have already become rich. You have become kings without us. And indeed, I wish that you had become kings. So that we also might reign with you. You think about this situation. You have the apostles who are being terribly mistreated. They're probably going to die. There's only one that we're not real sure if he was executed. The rest, we're almost positive we're executed. And we look at the rest of the Christians and it goes... A lot of them actually did well. A lot of them actually prospered. 
And this whole gospel of prosperity doesn't make any sense because what's he talking about? Don't exceed what's written. You haven't got anything on your own. God gave it to you. And this high attitude of I am better than you, he says, look to the apostles for a second. Look to the apostles and look at them and go, well, is that the kind of Christianity that looks like they're great? These are the same apostles who have no place to sleep, who are beaten and bruised and are poor and shut out. And he says about them that they're the apostles. These are our models. These are the ones who are sent there to represent and explain to us and give us the understanding of what the church is to be. And we look at them and go, let's look at them from the outside for a second. They don't look like kings to us. They don't, they don't look like they have much. No, they don't seem that big. They, they're not superior. And what they were doing was they were looking at this outside approach. And what happened was they were exceeding what was written. And it became no more. The way that we see a person is through the word of God. It was we see them and go, oh, Who's going to listen to them? The people they're trying to talk to just try to kill them. Seems very ineffective. Those who they're reaching out to are going to turn on them. And they don't have the same blessings we have. And they get this air of superiority. And in reality, the only way that judging was ever allowed was if it didn't exceed what was written. Too often when we want to judge somebody, we'll say, I think you're wrong. You're right. Okay. Because if you get your opinions and I get my opinions and we judge based on opinions, we generally just need to have a good old fight out. You know, let's draw and see who wins. Okay, you take 10 paces, I'll take 10 paces. The winner is right. No, the winner just had a faster draw. And it no longer becomes who's really right. It just becomes who wins. When, whenever we exceed what is written, we introduce ourselves in there and we say, well, I can tell your heart's not good. Really? Those same people who we see as models and will we'll let model for us, we later find out what? They were cheating on their wives. We later find out they had these immoral lives they were hiding. And all of a sudden, exceeding what is written becomes really dangerous. Becomes a matter of my opinion, your opinion, let's shoot it out. But he goes on with this concept and talks about the lowness of those who should be a model. Starting in verse 9. For I think God has exhibited us apostles last of all. As men condemned to death, because we have become a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are prudent in Christ. We are weak. You are strong. You are distinguished, but we are without honor. To this present hour, we are both hungry and thirsty, and are poorly clothed, and are roughly treated, and are homeless. And we toil working with our own hands. When we are reveled, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure. When we are slandered, we try to conciliate. We have become as the scum of the earth. The dregs of all things, even till now. I, I always, you always hear this phrase, put your best foot forward. And what they mean is, prepare to present yourself as different. You know, show up to a place and wear your best duds. You know, fanciest boots, throw on spurs if it's, you know, if it's a really nice one, you know, like a wedding or something. And what it, what it means is we have to put the best image forward. And you know what the apostles were? The worst image possible. They're the ones you put in the last, the back. You keep them kind of hidden in the dark area. You don't go, oh, here's this scum. Here is this roughly treated, this homeless, these beggars. What? There are, there, let me show you what Christianity is all about. Let's put them forward. Let's show these apostles. And it says, you 
have wealth. And we're kind of like those people at the gladiators. We're the last ones in. The last ones in don't get to win. You'll have a battle where it was man versus man. But when he talks about the last ones in, he's talking about the gladiators. The last ones in were the ones who got to face lions. And if you won, guess what? You got to face more lions. You were playing to die because, you know, if two guys fought and somebody didn't die well, you had to have a good finish. So they're talking about being the last ones. And what they're talking about is this Colosseum concept. This is Corinth. They're talking about these people who are put in there. Their only purpose is to suffer and die for our amusement. That's our models. Those are the ones we're supposed to look at and go, okay, they've, okay that's how Christianity works. Christianity works as those going, those who we say don't put forward are our best examples. Christianity threw something into the middle of a culture that didn't make sense. Do you realize at the time women were children, grown up children? That was it. You didn't like grow up and you know, you became a woman and you ran a household. No, you became a woman. You were just an older child. A 90 year old woman, if she had a son, might just be in charge of her. And Christianity came in, changed everything, and said, wait a minute. Our representatives are going to be those people you despise. Those women who, if they're born and you've already got a male son, you kill off the second one. This is the society of Corinth. And what he talks about is being those examples. Not judging based on these outward appearances, but looking at this and going, this is the model of good Christianity. Think about the beggar on the street and going, that's what Christianity looks like. I mean, that's what I'm seeing. I'm seeing roughly treated, poor clothes, hunger and thirst, homelessness. And looking at that and going, that's what Christianity is. Isn't it beautiful? Not this whole Sunday morning, let me tell you what you're supposed to wear to church. I, you cannot find this concept in the Bible. The concept of dressing up for God is not in the Bible. The concept of coming to God with a clean spirit. Offering not an outward appearance, but an inward. He talks about clothing. He talks about white and pure clothing. He's not referring to the outside. He's referring to the things that we bring to God. And let us look like this. Let's look like homeless beggars. Because that's our model. And Christianity has changed from being modeled by those who look the least in society. The last one standing. To us thinking of prosperity. Christianity is about doing well. And he doesn't condemn it. He says... I wish you had done well. That's great. You know, then we could, you know, benefit from each other. But it was never meant to be about it. Verse 14. I do not write these things to shame you, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For if you were to have count, countless tutors in Christ, yet you would not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Therefore, I exhort you, be imitators of me. For this reason, I have sent to you Timothy, who is my beloved and faithful child in the Lord. And he will remind you of my ways which are in Christ, just as I teach everywhere and in every church. Now some have become arrogant, as though I have never I am not coming, but I will come to you soon, if the Lord wills. And I shall find out not the words of those who are arrogant, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in words, but in power. What do you desire? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love and a spirit of gentleness? Children. He does this again. He talks to them, and after he is 
just gotten on to them, he says, children. He uses this phrase, child. He refers to Timothy as a child. He refers to those in Corinth as his children. It is not a matter of judging the heart. It is not a matter of judging the external. Because right here he's admitting that he's going to come and there's a chance that he's going to come as a judge. He says that. He says, would you rather me come as a loving parent in a spirit of gentleness? Big smiles, right? Or would you like me to come with a rod? I mean, mo most of us have had children. Think about this a second. They get two options. They can do what's right, and you come with this, oh, good job, or they do what's wrong, and you come in with a whole nine wrath, right? A woman scorned. Ah, I was always more afraid of my mama, trust me. She got angry. You were in trouble. Daddy would whoop you. Mama would look at you, talk to you, and whoop you, and it was just like, no, I'll take the whooping. But he offers that. He says, do you want me to come in that spirit of gentleness? Or do I need to come and judge you? Judge you by a godly standard. He says, I'm not going to judge by your outward appearances or how fluffy your speech is or how good you are at presenting yourself. I'm going to judge you based on the power. I'm going to judge you by how real God has lived out in you. I'm going to judge you not as the world judges. Not focused on those things that we shouldn't be focused on. And only judging this. What is written? Looking at the Bible and saying, the Bible says this. God has spoken. Are you living that part out? And not looking at somebody and going, well, I, I was told this in college. It is disrespectful not to wear a tie when you preach. It disrespects those who came before you. And I was like, I don't remember the apostles ever wearing anything like that. I've read about togas. They don't even look like that. Jesus was a Jew. I hope he didn't wear a tie. That would have been awkward for everyone. Well, who were these ones who came before? And the truth is, it's easy to get focused on that, right? Because when I first meet you, my only impression of you is what you're wearing, what you look like, and if you're really tall. Sorry, tall people are nice people too. And that's normal. And the problem is when I say normal, we need to once again go, ooh, we're supposed to be supernatural, not natural. We're supposed to be looking at people and like, let me get past your physical appearance. Let me actually learn about you. Let me try to get to know you and judge only on what is actually done, the real things, and not just what you say or what you look like or where you come from or any other standard that God doesn't allow. Christ spoke of judging and he mentioned another type of judging and it was the same concept. He said, if someone comes to your party, right? And they're all dressed in their nice duds, right? The spurs are on there, remember? The shiny ones? And they come in and you go, okay, you know, we have a really nice seat right here. And then somebody comes else and they're, you know, nasty chaps, you know, whatever. And you go, okay, you sit in the back over there. Just sit on the floor somewhere. It's okay. He says, don't do that. Don't you know that it's the rich that are oppressing you? Don't you know that they're the ones causing problem? And you're doing what... All time's going to do is look at people from the outside and go, well, someone to be respected. And the truth is, I want you to take away this image of the apostles as this hobo. I want you to take away this hobo and go, that's what Christianity looks like. And if you take away this hobo look for the apostles, then Christianity can work. 
And we'll look at somebody and go, they look like a hobo. Maybe they're an apostle. You know, maybe they're a great Christian who really lives out God. Instead of going our first thought, oh, I wonder what they've been doing. Probably something immoral. But he tells us this, and he leaves us with this option of not judging the heart. Next week, we're going to talk about that there are times when judging is necessary. But this week, I want you to leave here with that concept of Christianity being that hobo. You know, somebody walking in here stinking. I know, I'm thinking of you, Jeff, don't worry. <laughs> they told me what you did. Uh, but no, th this hobo coming in and us going, and I wonder if they're the best Christian in here. And really considering that as a valid option. Mark 16, verses 15 and 16. And he said to them, Go into all the world. Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. There is a judgment coming. And God has given us his word. He has taught us. You read 1 Corinthians 15 this morning. He died for our sin. He rose to be our Lord. Having heard the word of Christ, having believed that Jesus is Lord, repenting of your sins, confessing Jesus as Lord, being baptized into Christ so that we may live for him and not face condemnation, a final judgment. If there's anybody who needs to respond to Christ's invitation, or if there's anybody who needs prayers, or if you'd like to submit to the eldership here, we ask that you come now as we stand and as we sing.